Making a sheet of paper is relatively easy. Children can do it in school. But making good paper, sheet after sheet after sheet, is extremely difficult. So when we didn't know the difference, we thought, well, it will take us a couple of months to figure this out. And it took us years. Our idea was to make paper in the same sense that a fine art printmaking studio makes prints. Catherine had been a printmaker and worked in those kind of places. And that's really what our idea was, making editions of papers for editions of prints. It was really very difficult the first three or four years as we were trying to figure out how to make paper because we didn't have anyone to really learn from. But we really only needed to have a roof over our heads and why not go ahead and try to ch learn something new that hadn't been done before. When you're involved in something, you, you tend to get very serious about everything and think that everything is night, and, you know, is black and white and that things here are, are awful. And then we realized that things weren't that awful. I mean, we could survive, and if uh, we weren't going to starve, we may as well give it a couple more weeks. And if we could get through those weeks, then maybe we'd be all right, and we did. We never thought that we would be making as much paper as we're making today, that Twin Rocker would be as big as it is today, that there would be even as big a market as there is today in our lifetime. Because at that time, 15 years ago, Almost no one in the United States had ever even heard of handmade paper, much less seen a, one sheet of handmade paper. When I met Howard in graduate school, um, I thought one of the very disappointing things was that he was a mechanical engineer and, and I was an artist and there was no way we were ever going to be able to to work together. But little did we know that someday we would move to a family farm in Indiana and end up spending our lives every single day uh, making paper. People who visit Twin Rocker are often surprised at all the machinery. You know, we're supposed to be making this by hand, which is an, an interesting thing. What's the difference between handmade and machine made? Here in this shop, I made about 40 beaters and 60 presses for other paper makers. And somewhere along the line, in each one, I bled on them because if at one point or other I get cut and bleed on the machine. And yet, you know, the, the reception of it was that it was just a machine, but it was a handmade machine. Handmade is a loaded term. Um, people tend to have images of, of something sort of um, the next thing to a plant, you know, almost uh, growing naturally out of the ground. And yet, any kind of craft objects that we work with are things that we have made. Paper's one of them. The whole paper process is based on water and the cellulose and plant fiber. Paper can be made from almost any plant. This is flax. But plants that are also used in the manufacture of fabrics or rope work best as they contain the most cellulose. The plant fiber is cooked in a mild caustic such as wood ash for about four to six hours. This cooking dissolves the impurities, the non-cellulose material, and neutralizes the caustic. If we want a very white paper, we use cotton. For a tawny color, we would use flax. Rinsing the fiber with water washes away the non-cellulose material. 
Beginning with the Chinese in about 100 AD, hammers were used to beat the pulp. In the 1600s, the Dutch came up with a rotary machine, the Hollander beater. This is what we use today. The key to transforming the fiber into paper is the pounding of the fiber in the presence of water. This cotton has already been processed. It's been cleaned, cooked, and bleached. The beater continuously pounds the pulp. The action is similar to squeezing and releasing a sponge in a bucket of water. Here the fiber is beginning to be beaten. Right here it's still fiber and water. In an hour or so it's pulp. The main tool of the paper maker is the mold, which is basically a sieve of wire mesh. In order to form a sheet of paper, the paper maker dips the mold in the vat and then shake the mold in two directions in order to interlock the fibers and weave an even sheet. Cooching is the term for transferring the layer of pulp intact onto a wool felt. The paper maker builds up a sandwich of wool felt paper, wool felt paper. It's a surface tension of water that keeps it from falling off the mold when the paper maker turns the mold upside down. And then when the paper maker actually cooches the mold, he's intentionally breaking the surface tension so that the pulp will be released from the mold very evenly. The hydraulic press squeezes the water out and then the paper can be dried. The thing about industry and mass production is that it's set up with tools and jigs and things so that if the operator gets the piece anywhere near the machine, the machine takes over and finishes it. Whereas when you make it by hand, if you lose concentration, you'll destroy the piece of paper or mess up the suit and pair of shoes or whatever. So, you know, it's all, it's all relative. And I think when something is made by hand, it's uh, somehow or other, it has the mark of the maker in it. When you work on paper as an artist, you grow to love it. Um, you love the surface and you love the quality of it. And handmade paper is so much more beautiful than um, machine-made paper because it isn't mechanically boring. It has a life of its own. It is subtly irregular. No two sheets are exactly alike. Handmade paper is important to me as a calligrapher because it combines two crafts that are dependent on each other. The calligrapher depends on paper to make his mark, and of course the paper maker makes paper for people to make marks on. It was always more of a thrill to write on handmade paper. It gives a different look. I think there's a real aliveness about it. 
the deckle edges and the, the texture, the surface texture, and pulling the pen over that handmade paper. There's just a great deal more satisfaction knowing that somebody had made this by hand and that you're participating and kind of marrying these two crafts together with your work and, and the work of the paper maker. I've applied for a couple jobs as a graphic artist recently, and I've been told, uh, what you need to do is go learn computers. <laughs> I'm going to throw up. And they'll also say, well, you know, computers can do that stuff. But they can't. I think if you're enthusiastic about the job that you have, your work will show it. You'll put that love and care into the work and, and approach it with an enthusiasm that shows up in your writing. It's not that an artist is a special kind of person, but that every person is a special kind of artist, and that we all have that capability of combining uh, working with our hands and, and using our mind at the same time to create something beautiful that makes us feel good about ourselves. I think it's really important that Twin Rocker is here. It's a real tough business, I think, to keep this craft of paper making going. And having worked with Catherine and Howard, I know that they're very hard workers. And, you know, if it wasn't for their persistence, Twin Rocker wouldn't be here. Relationships and business is a difficult combination, particularly when you're starting from scratch. And uh, it can either pull a relationship together or drive it apart. In those days, when everybody we knew was getting divorced, and it seemed that somehow we were sort of out of it because uh, you know, we weren't hip, we weren't experiencing life fully if we were still married. But um, by this time, we had so much at stake here. The thing was just about to start to work, and uh, there were pressures to force us to, to deal with each other, and it was good. In San Francisco, when we first started making paper, it was unbelievable. It was like paper was the medium that had been forgotten somehow. No one knew how to make it in this country, and so consequently, it was the link that didn't exist in art. And as soon as we started making paper, everyone just came to us, and they wanted to know what we were doing. We didn't know how to make paper well, and people wouldn't accept that. They said, you must, you know how to do it, you're doing it, therefore you know how to do it professionally, and we just, we didn't. And we almost felt like we had to escape San Francisco in order to go to the country, in order to be alone, to really learn what we were doing. And then after making paper for about a year, we were just at the point where we had to decide where we were going to be for the next 20 years. And Howard's father died. And that caused us to make the decision to go back to the family farm in Brookston, Indiana, and to actually build a hand paper mill there, which would be, in a sense, the first American hand mill that had been built since uh, 1929. We wanted very much to go to Europe to look at the existing hand mills, but we just didn't have the money. And it was one thing or the other. We couldn't uh, possibly go there and try to start a paper mill, so we just started. And in some ways, that was an advantage, because we didn't know what we couldn't do. So we did some things that uh, we never would have done had we learned the European methods. For instance, we make very large sheets of paper, and we do it because we just get on um, each end of the mold. In the European mills, they are so um, fixed, and there's so much equipment around that you can't get at the ends of the vat. And so the idea of picking a mold up at two ends would never occur to them because it wouldn't work. There's no way to get at each end of the vat. When we first began Twin Rocker, we were concerned that what we were doing was not just uh, redoing an old technique, uh, historically recreating something that was dying. Because we felt as though there was something in handmade paper that uh, people today need and can use and would appreciate. From year to year, everything changes. Uh, our way of looking at what we're doing and our customers' way of looking at the things we are producing. And I think that's real healthy. In order to, to stay abreast of any business, even if you're selling shoes, you have to do that. You have to keep in there and uh, never get complacent. And it's fun. That's the, the part that's uh, good about it, because it never does stay the same. And what happens is that when you come up with an innovation, 
This stimulates the people that we're making paper for. And so then they say, well, how about this? And the whole thing built. And uh, that's really one of the real rewards of what we do is that it just it gets more and more interesting. We just started making watercolor paper about um, two years ago, three years ago. Well, it's one of the most difficult papers to make because it has a surface sizing of high glue or gelatin. We didn't even try to attempt to make watercolor paper years ago. We knew that was really down the line. But then Howard has said, well, okay, now it's time to really start thinking about making watercolor paper. We're ready for this now. And it's not making one sheet of watercolor paper that works really well in the gelatin sizing. It's making sheet after sheet after sheet. When uh, I first met Kathy and Howard Clark, they were producing a very fine handmade paper for printmakers, and they were interested in doing a watercolor paper. One of the early problems though, was in the sizing. The, uh, when this was, I think, the, the key to a good watercolor paper is in its sizing. With, with sizing, the pigment is not absorbed in as readily. I mean, the paint would not, it went into the paper, it absorbed in it. It didn't give me any time to work with it. It was not a forgiving paper. You had to be right the first time. But they would come back with another sample of paper, and I would start playing with it, several samples. And I would say, okay, this one's getting better. This works for my technique. Now I'm extremely pleased with the sizing. I think they have got it. The paint, uh, when, you, when you put it on the paper, you've got just the right amount of time for it to, to manipulate it. And, but once it sets up, it's there. It doesn't, uh, you can go back and put some washes on it, and it doesn't have a tendency to come loose like the earlier papers did. Handmade paper has a uh, organic look about it as opposed to the mechanical look that machine-made papers have. And if it's a mechanical process, you have a pattern which is very boring. Whereas handmade paper, there's little dips, hills and valleys, so to speak, that the pigment settles into. They're more natural, more organic, and it gives you a more of a free-flowing, uh, aesthetically appealing uh, pattern. Now, every time you put a wash on there, you cut down a little bit of the light coming through, where Twin Rocker paper has a whiteness that other papers don't have. When you're working with a transparent medium, such as watercolor, you put it on, the whiteness of that paper comes through. I mean, it comes up through the layers of pigment. If uh, I'm going to take my time and my talents to put it on a piece of paper, I want that paper to last. And I, I mean, this paper will last as long as canvas. A good handmade paper without uh, acid and that sort of thing in it will last as long as canvas under the proper conditions. When a very famous artist is doing a, a drawing on paper, we need something that is very, very high quality. It needs to be archival. It needs to last. It needs to be permanent. Uh, the Museum of Modern Art wants to be able to keep it forever, you know, and not have it deteriorate. We would like to see Twin Rocker be here hundreds of years from now. Um, so then we said, well, gosh, you know, maybe we should have been in a big city. Maybe we should have been in New York. And we started to slowly realize that actually Brookston may be the very, very perfect place for a hand mill to be because it's a tiny town that loves itself. You know, people in Brookston love to, to live here. It's a beautiful town. Families stay here generation after generation. You look at the phone book and they're all the... The tailors and one of the interesting things we found when we when we decided that we really needed to hire local people so there'd be some continuity from group to group and uh, we were concerned because all the people that had been our helpers up to that point had had at least a, a bachelor's degree in art most of them had master's degree 
And we weren't going to find trained artists in uh, Brookston, you know, people with, with training and skills. It turns out, though, that we had no problem at all. There is a, in small towns, because of the fact that things are relatively static, um, there's a concern about craftsmanship and skills. It's just part of the small town fabric. People are known as a good welder or a good carpenter or whatever, and they're proud of that. Before I came to work here, I didn't really have any idea about where paper came from. I just, it was there. I used it, I threw it away. Now I realize that most paper you buy in the store is made from wood pulp. All our paper is made from cotton, primarily. It's probably the most unusual craft that you can imagine. You dip each sheet individually and you see it form right in front of your eyes and you know you have to pay attention, you have to take care that it's done right each time. There's a whole lot of different steps in which problems can occur um, when the sheet is formed. If you shake it a little too much uh, the pulp kind of rolls across the mold and can have problems there. Uh, cooching can be a problem. If you're off just a little bit one way or the other, then the sheet will kind of lop over the side. It's, it's easy to mess it up sometimes, you know. We're not just a huge factory churning out uh, a product that's the same from one end to another. It's each sheet special, each sheet's different. One might be a little thinner. One might have better formation uh, and when we get done with this kind, we're going to make another kind that's even neater, and that's what makes us special. I think when we move into Brookston, downtown Brookston, that is, we'll be more in the public eye, so to speak, and people will be stopping by more often, uh, wanting to know what's going on in that place. This is our new mill. This was a uh, former tractor dealership, and uh, this area will be packing and shipping area. We're about a block from the warehouse. We'll be able to both bring fiber over here much easier and we'll be able to start, store a larger uh, working quantity. This is our new beater room, much larger than the old. We will eventually add another beater. For sound, we've built a double concrete block wall with this uh, ceiling suspended on the inner wall. Also, for doors, we're using walk-in freezer doors to try to seal the sound in and contain it. In this area, we'll have the 200-ton press. Present press is a 50-ton, so it'll be a much larger press. And in this area, where the light is good along the street in Brookston, uh, we'll have our vats. There'll be probably three vats set up here at all times, including the very large vat. Uh, this will make it easier to change from one size to another and we'll be able to make a lot more paper than we can now. Also, with everything under one roof, it's going to be just a lot easier for us to, to uh, process the paper. Collaboration is a very interesting experience. When you collaborate with somebody, you, you do something that you wouldn't do by yourself. So when I met Michael Gullick, it was just a natural. He wanted to come and use the studio here to print a limited edition book with our press. Michael was here for about a month uh, printing the book as I was making the paper. About five or six years ago, I bought a paperback in England which contained translations from early Arabic poetry. So eventually I wrote to the translators who did these poems, and they gave me some unpublished translations by a 7th century Arab poet whose name is Majun Laila. As far as collaborating is concerned, it may seem odd to come, what, 3,000, 4,000 miles to, uh, to work with somebody who is a paper maker. But I couldn't find the right paper on which to print the poems on. And the whole point and purpose, or one of the purposes, of making a fine book is to be absolutely convinced in the materials that you use to make the book.
Making books is often rather a solitary occupation. And people tend to work by themselves in isolation. And it's not very often that people perhaps do collaborate person to person in the same place at the same time. But I think that Catherine and I in this book have tried to extend in a very small way something of the craft and the art of bookmaking. My day is like any man's day. At night, sleep fans me to her face. As I gossip with friends, I fret. But in the dark, we are married. Our love is wet as thumb to hand. Um, this is a, a gray cotton rag paper. It has a little black fleck. And, you know, that's an interesting kind of thing, but too cruel cool for these wonderful love poems. But this one is, is the one that um, I felt excited about. I think partly because it was thin and lots of book papers are somehow too heavy and thick. And I like the, the texture very much, the surface texture. It's amazing that Twin Rocker can exist in the middle of Indiana when all of our customers are in big cities in New York and Los Angeles and Dallas. I left Indiana when I was 18 years old, never to return, because I felt like Indiana was just nowhere. But if what you do is good, um, people will find you, and it doesn't really matter where you are. And that's an important lesson that I learned, and I really like to tell people who are in the middle of nowhere, other nowheres that they can stay there. They don't have to go to New York or Los Angeles to do what they want to do. I heard a quote by an actor once who was asked to, to give advice to a young, aspiring actor, and he said, um, don't do it unless you have to. If you feel that you're onto something that you like or that, that you think the rest of the world would like, <laughs> to go do it, no matter what it is, no matter how ridiculous it might seem. I mean, the idea of making your living making paper by hand seemed to be just completely off the wall. 